Starting positions for the glide. Obviously we want to get to the uh, center of the ring. We want to get our right foot to the back of the ring. We want to put our, our weight primarily on the right leg. And we want to get our, of course, our grip and our, and our shot in our neck. And I think a focal point about 10 to 15 feet out is a good idea for a lot of athletes that you coach in terms of keeping your eyes locked on that as the, as the glide begins. When the glide begins, one of the most common errors that you guys are all coaching and correcting is the tendency to want to turn the head a little bit prematurely. You know, they're starting to peek at the throw before they're actually <coughs> across the ring. Having a focal point kind of locks in their head and keeps that upper body hopefully locked in the same position. Because again, we want to land back here with the shot well back. If we're turning it all in the course of doing the glide, we're losing that torque, we're losing that position that we need so desperately. So a focal point's a good idea. From there, we've got all sorts of different options in terms of how to start the throw. Again, we're trying to be sprinters. Um, there is the uh, standard, raise the leg, bring the leg in, and, and unseat and go. There's um, Alessandro Andre, one of the top throwers in the history of the world, a 75 footer. He did what I, I call the drop and go, I don't know what the technical term is, but it's, it's here. Drop and go. Why don't you demo that, because I'm old and I can't really do that very well. Drop and go. Really nice way to combine the dropping and unseating aspect of a glide to add additional momentum. I don't know about you guys, but not every athlete has the ability to start in this kind of a static position, waiting here forever, and then try to get moving. A drop and go tends to add a little bit more momentum. Um, other starting positions, let's see, let's talk about that more of an active a position, this one where you raise up and go. So this is the one I demonstrated, and it's the one my daughter uses, just kind of a standard raise it, bring it in, and then go. This one's a little bit more raise it, up on the ball of the foot, a little more active, a little more dynamic. That one, it's like out here, bring it up. Yeah, a little bit of the Ulf Timmerman model there. Really, I don't recommend that one just, just because it's really difficult, but if you've got a very well-balanced athlete with a good pair of gliding shoes and is pretty athletic, it's a great way to add additional momentum. I, I think in terms of sprinters and the blocks, what happens right when they say set? They raise their butts up from that standing position and they're all coiled and they're ready to explode out of the blocks. That little raise up on the toe provides a little bit extra poise, coil, and go. So I think there are many options there. I recommend you know, your younger, younger athletes just being as stable and as consistent as possible, okay? So however you choose, that's, that's fine. What we're trying to achieve is to bring the left leg in knee to knee with the right leg. And from there, we are exploding and kicking back with the left with all that we've got. The right leg is not as involved as you would think. The right leg tends to be the, the last portion of the body that moves as a result of the left leg kicking violently to the toe board. I want you to show the A drill real quick. Just to demonstrate how the right heel will lag. That's pretty much what's going to happen as you're stretching all the way back. And that right toe will begin to turn midair, bring it to the middle and turn so that we're in a dynamic standing position again. Um, so, thank you. so besides the, the starting position um, and, and the tendency to open up throughout the throw, the other risk, of course, is to pop up in the middle of the glide, right? We, we really want a nice straight line, a nice low line to the toe board. And a lot of throwers, including my daughter, will struggle with this whole pop up, 
and, and our, our energy is moving here, here, and here, as opposed to the quickest, uh, shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So we don't want to have our forces head up and then down. And the only thing I've, I've known to correct that is to really emphasize the kick being as low to the ground as possible. Anytime you're flying that leg way up in the air as you're kicking, you're only asking for that loss of linear momentum and you're asking for the, the teeter-totter effect. When you finally bring this left leg down, where's your center of gravity? It's here as opposed to being well over that right leg ready to turn and activate the throw. So popping up is a bad thing. Drills to correct that. Uh, the rope drill, having a, having a rope held across from both ends at a certain height so the athlete has to stay below it as they're kicking. I've used a broom handle when I'm in particularly mean moods so that they'll bonk, bonk their heads on it. No, they, they, every time I put something there, any piece of pipe or any, any object, it's amazing how they will get under it. They will stay flat every single time. Um, any other, any other issues with uh, the glide approach? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you get? I think for a lot of athletes, it's kind of a, an audio, but you have to hear it. And, and this type of a wood ring is really helpful in, in getting, hearing that pop. But at least that's the way I try to teach them. Why don't you go ahead and do a glide and see if we can emphasize that? Yeah, Coach, do you have any specific drills for that? Because I, other than getting them to see it and hear it, I don't really practice or drill that. I think he was able to do it. He was able to land feet almost simultaneously, so probably right and left, you know. But I think he was able to do that because uh, he dropped his hips and had his hips moving towards the, the throw. Um, and when he came off the back of the circle, he stayed low to the ground. His, in fact, his right foot probably slid just a little bit, and that's what his marks were from. Which I don't mind that too much if they're not dragging terribly. They can, they can slide a little bit as long as they're getting their foot underneath them and turn. Um, but it, I think it, it comes from the start mechanics. If you don't unseat your hips and you end up pushing up off the back, I guarantee you, you're going to land tall on the right. That's going to hit nice and early. You're going to land tall on the right, and then you're going to pitch over to the left. You're going to lose that position back over your, your working leg. You're going to tall, pitch left. And coaches, if you videotape your throwers, I guarantee you when they're finishing, they're going to be way off this right foot when they're delivering the shot. And that's because of the mechanics out of the back. If, he's not, if this person is not unseating and having that nice hip drop down towards the throw and shooting that left nice and low, that left can actually skim the top of the circle and coming off the heel and staying in that position. Ian did a really nice job of demonstrating that, staying low to the ground. You didn't see his head and his body move up, land tall, shift left. But I think it's the mechanics out of the back will, if they do that right, the feet will come down almost simultaneous. Thank you.